like a furry torpedo to the jugular. This is Honey Badger Radio, radio with bite. Hello and welcome to Honey Badger Radio. Tonight's topic is no topic. We're having open lines, so you can call in with whatever you want to talk about. You can even call in to troll. Just be fun, just be surprising, just be interesting, just don't be boring. The call-in number is 310-388-9709. That's 1-310-388-9709. If you're new to the show, you can check out our other episodes at www.youtube.com slash users slash radio. And that's where you can find our previous episodes to find out what we're about. Again, this is Honey Badger Radio, and we are basically the epicenter of evil, at least according to the feminists. We think we want to bring about equality for both men and women, not just equality that only counts one side of the equation, namely the female side of the equation. We want to bring about equality that, that focuses on both men and women and make sure that men aren't left out. And that, of course, makes us evil, truly evil, the kind of people you just don't want to associate with. And if you're interested in making sure our evil message gets out to more people, please consider donating to the show. That helps defray costs when it comes to advertising and producing content and improving the show sound. Once again, if you want to improve the show sound, you have to fork over the money because we just, we. We're already, you know, all of us, we're not, we're not working, we're not driving Mercedes, and we're not holding out on you. We, if you want the show sound to improve, you do have to actually donate to the show so we can afford to make the necessary improvements. So once again, please donate if you want to spread evil and make evil sound quality better so it can go further. And uh, to donate, you can go to our website. That's www.honeybadgerbrigade.com. If you want to donate it, there's a little bit of a trick to it. Uh, You have to click the cards underneath the uh, donate button. Because we did that just because we only want to get money from smart people. You know, stupid people can just just keep on going. You can can donate to one of the, the, the various inane feminist talking heads on YouTube. But I want to go now to, uh, since it's open lines and we're just going to take people and take you guys can take us wherever you want to go. You can even troll us. Have fun. I'm going to go now to California guy. California guy, you're on the air. Hello. Uh, hi. Typhon Blue. Uh, I'm in. <laughs> um, yeah. Actually, hi. actually, wait, wait. Just a sec. Just a sec. I completely freaking forgot. My name is Allison Tiemann, otherwise known as Typhon Blue. Joining me today is Hannah Wallen, my co-host every week, and also uh, our special guest host, Sage Gerard, also known as Victor Said. Please look him up on YouTube. He's got some great roastings of feminists. Uh, Karen Strawn, Girl White's What, is currently lecturing in Ryerson U., and uh, hopefully she'll be able to join us later, but it, it, it probably she won't since she got swamped and everybody's now asking her questions at Ryerson U. And you know how it is. Everybody wants a piece of her, so yeah. Hey. We have yeah, to go is, this, without. This is, this oh, yeah, is James. Also, sorry sorry James to interject. Up. Sorry to, sorry <laughs> to interject, but Duckman is, is talking. Oh, okay. Yeah, Duckman? so... Yeah, I'm hoping uh, we can get him to call in later, maybe. Uh, so yeah. Ask ask him what it is he asked Karen. Uh, but yeah, uh, we have featured Eric Duckman on HBR before, and we've also done the same on AVFM News and Activism. And uh, there were a few other people in that crowd that I think uh, everybody would know. Um, of course, the uh, Steve Fillet is actually putting it out for everyone to see. We got Attila Vinzer out there um, and, and a few other individuals. Uh, yeah, great, great stuff. We've got uh, uh, Christian uh, Chiasan, our co-host for Tales from the Infrared, 
is also in the crowd right now. Um, and we're referring to the crowd that's watching Karen. Uh, that, that, and her speech was, Are Men Obsolete? Feminism, Free Speech, and the Censorship of Men's Issues. It was put on by the Canadian Equality for, or sorry, the Canadian Association for Equality. And uh, yeah, so uh, that's sort of why it's a light show tonight, because nobody is watching us. They're all watching Karen for good reason, because she's more fun. We just suck. We're the nosebleeds. Anyway. <laughs> California guy, where do you want to take us tonight? Well, um, well, I, there's a few things I want to let out of my chest first. And it's um, after learning about male disposability, it can – it can really make you angry, you know, when you finally learn it, you know, you, it makes you, um, how can I put it? Like you just start to hate society. You're just very angry. I don't think I'm the only one here. That... Hello? But, well, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Here. yeah, keep going. You just need to drop out there. I'm for sorry. A bit. You just keep cutting off. I don't know if it's like blog talk or something. It's blog talk. Oh. We just keep going. Just keep going. Okay, and um, so yeah, it does. It, it does make you very angry. Um, although to be honest, it, it, male disposability is also something we don't really notice until it's pointed out to us. Like uh, I remember learning about Latin American history, and they talked about only how men um, were the ones sent over to the Americas for the colonies. To establish colonies, I mean, and you know how like, um, but mainly because they felt well, it was too dangerous for women. And of course, at the same time, you know, well, they were saying about how Southern Europe was more patriarchal than I don't know, um, what do you call it, than the rest of Europe. And of course, when I first read that, it's like, oh, okay, like it crossed your mind. It wasn't until you sort of brought it up that it's it all starts to click, you know, you start to, you're like, oh, oh, wow. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, yeah, well, you're you're cutting, you're cutting in and out, but we've, we've got the, we, we've certainly got the gist of, of what it is you're, you're talking about, California guy. Um, yeah, I mean, the fact of the matter is that most people walk through their day-to-day -day life without ever realizing uh, exactly uh, what it takes in the way of blood, sweat, and tears to keep an entire modern civilization rolling along. And the fact that it's uh, primarily men who are shedding all those blood, sweat, and tears to to do that. Um, the thing that I like to focus on is, is the idea of needless male disposability or Male disposability through the will of others um, for the express purposes of, of attaining power over other human beings. Uh, I've got absolutely no problem with a man who, as an individual, decides to perform some course of action that's going to place him in the line of fire or in some kind of position of duty or danger uh, because he happens to love his family. Uh, and realizes that he has a skill set uh, or a talent that uh, he can use uh, to, to to make a living, even though it's dangerous for him. I've, I don't have a problem with with a man making that individual decision. What what I think the anger stems from is the idea that we don't recognize. Uh, and we don't honor the uh, sacrifices of such men. Now, quite a few of them out there are humble enough to go, well, I don't need none of that shit. I just want to get on and, and live my life peacefully. Mm -hmm. But uh, when when you've got types of uh, policies in, in legislation um, uh, that continue to demonize men solely for being men, uh, and without recognition uh, of what it is they're capable of doing, yeah, your your anger is absolutely justified. Uh, there's no problem 
there's there's no nothing wrong at all with with feeling that anger or expressing that anger however you have to ask yourself is your expression of that anger going to serve a constructive use is that expression of anger going to serve um uh, is it going to serve to better yourself mm-hmm. and potentially other people or is it going to be self-destructive in nature and this is where uh i get a lot of i get a lot of uh, interesting comments specifically from men who are feeling down in the dumps who are very suicidal because you know they they especially when they first come in and they start picking up these things uh they they say uh we we don't know how to take it we don't know how to deal with the with the knowledge of our own disposability so they start feeling really down and really suicidal and uh you know it's our job to try to talk people back from that ledge and perhaps put them on a course of action uh that that creates a constructive framework in their life well i would say yeah. that um i would say that uh you know changing the idea of male ex- expendability really starts with each individual guy deciding he's not expendable of course the process of that is is painful because you recognize how society is treating you and society is now treating you in a way that isn't congruent with the way you feel like you should be treated and you know that's I, I can imagine that would be a very difficult pill to swallow um, personally and if you want to know my my point of view I don't know it's sort of a point of view that it's not a male point of view it's a female point of view the, the one that really got me was circumcision that how could you treat little babies like infant boys with such disregard and and what really got me was the fact that they recommend anesthesia when you're for example castrating cattle but they don't even regularly do it for when they're doing genital surgery on infant boys they don't even seem to care how much pain they're in and you know it's it's pain equivalent to shoving a bamboo spike underneath your nail your uh your fingernail and then we're going to get back and forth until the fingernail pops off and we're like, oh, no, they can handle that, <laughs> you know, two, three-year-old, day-old boys. And that just blew my mind for the longest time. Um, I actually experienced a very long depression about it. Um, was there anything else you wanted to add, California guys, before I hand the mic off to to Sage? Um, well, I just want to say um, thank you for what you're doing and um Talk about what else? Even though it's depressing, I would rather I took the. I'm really glad I took the red pill instead of you know blissful and ignorance. So. Yeah, in a lot of ways, it's uh, it's good good to know about this stuff and understand it, rather than just ignoring and letting it perpetuate into the next generation. You know, at some point we have to stand up and say, you know, no more. This, this is, we're done with this. Let's move on to something better. Let's move on to a better song to sing, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And sorry, um, go on ahead. this note, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry to inter- interject. Um, what I was wanting to add on to the, all of this was the fact that when it comes to male disposability, a lot of it comes from uh, the, a kind of a, a kind of a men passively becoming permissible in terms of um how people feel how people feel about uh men and how well they assert themselves how to put this you know how when um you know how you men as a man you don't really want to feel like you're burdening other people with your problems you don't want to feel like that when you bring up something that's bothering you somehow you're adding on to somebody else's stress and that kind of gets to an extreme where guys don't even feel like they're allowed to express their emotions whatsoever. And a lot of the most unhealthy anger, a lot of the most um, unhealthy expressions of one's feelings come as a product of rumination and isolation, which is what you get when you're essentially forced to act like a stoic. But no one's really stoic. No one can really 
uh, I mean, we I do believe that on some level we are emotional beings, and um, it, it's it, I wouldn't certainly base decision making on emotions alone, but being emotional is something that people do, and denying them that nature is just something that's just caught, that causes a lot of psychological damage, and eventually when the emotional needs are denied for so long, then the people who have, the men who felt that they couldn't say anything now will stop caring entirely about what people think of them and will go on to say sometimes the most horrific things. So, um, but this isn't to say that there's no rational reason for them to have gotten that way. It's just that it's better to go ahead and make an issue of something early when it's, when it's healthy to do so. Just assert yourself so that you don't go into the so you don't go in and bottle up your emotions and turn into essentially a monster down the road. I've seen some people go through this route. So yeah, about uh, one of the ways to uh, counteract male disposability is just to yeah, as Allison said, recognize that you're not disposable and don't let the society pretend that you are. If somebody has something to say that's somehow harmful to you or somehow just um, it, it, that's ignorance of your feelings, then just freaking make an issue of it. Say, you know what, fuck you. I really don't think I did anything wrong. And if you have a problem with that, then that's your problem, not mine. I'm okay, and that's just the end of it. Yeah, yeah thank you so. for that, Sage. Um, sorry to interrupt you, uh, California guy, but I want to announce no. that uh, I want to announce that um, we have Jim or Ginkgo from Gender okay. Addict, my co-blogger on the line. And uh, say hello, Jim. Hey. Um, this is another California guy. And so um, and I'm calling in response to, to his call, a couple of issues that he brought up. Um, I'm going to turn this I'm gonna turn this down because I'm, you guys are I'm interfering with myself. A uh, couple of bullet things um, without much explanation in response. First off, Disposability is in itself not a bad thing. Um, it's the adult part. It's, a, it's part of the adult role in any community. Um, the problem comes when it's gendered, when one gender is expected to make himself completely disposable, that his whole value is based on his utility and his disposability, um, and, uh, and, the, and, he, and he's doing it for the benefit of the other gender. This is bad for two things. First, it's dehumanizing for the man, but it's infantilizing for, uh, for women because it's, it, you, adults sacrifice themselves for the sake of children. When you sacrifice yourself for someone, for that moment at least, you're putting them in the role of a child that you're looking out for. And this goes back and forth naturally in every relationship. Sometimes one sacrifices, the other sacrifices. One time the one's the, the adult, the other's the child. It's supposed to go back and forth in a balanced kind of way. But when it is ossified into a system where one uh, is, is the continual uh, functional parent and the other is the continual child, that's dehumanizing for both. Um, and I think the whole man-child trope that is so, the whole bumbling dad, all that kind of stuff, I think that is an ego protection that develops so that women don't have to face the fact of their own permanent uh, functional childhood. Um, they get to think of themselves as mommy knows best when, in fact, they know they're completely dependent on the disposability of their men. Secondly, next point, <clears throat> when you use your sex to uh, gain a material advantage by the, by the standards, basically, of any uh, jurisdiction that is prostitution if you're going to if you're going to uh, bang someone up for being a pimp all you have to show is that he or she um, used someone as a as a prostitute for any kind of material gain it can be drugs it can be money it can be housing it can be food it can be anything and so when you use your sex for a material advantage and this is what this gender disposability is you are turning yourself into a prostitute um, the traditional female role is pretty much prostitutional. And this is one of the reasons why it is such a, such a sore point, such a raw nerve for a lot of women. They can't, you know, whore is, is, bitch is bad, but calling a woman a whore is like the ultimate. Because underneath they know that that's what their role is. They're trading sex for food, for housing, um, for consideration, rather than just taking it themselves. 
Um, the, the third thing about about disposability, and Sage, you made this point very well, it's fine if you do it as a personal choice. In other words, it's fine if you do it consciously. All of these things are fine if they're conscious choices. What's not fine is when it is forced on you as the price of belonging to society. You know, it's one thing to choose to sit in the back of the bus because it's actually the most secure place. You see the back of it. You see everybody. They don't see you. It's quite a different thing when you are told that that's the only place you can sit. They're fundamentally different, and it's the same thing with this disposability. Um, I have a pretty good personal experience of disposability. I was a career Army officer for a long time. Um, didn't make a full career of it. Well, I, actually, I did in the reserves. I'm, I'm aware of that culture. Um, and by the way, um, that culture is both male and female. Military women pretty much take on that disposability. And in fact, when it's questioned, um, they're insulted. Uh, there was, and I forget her first name, but um, England, no, I forget. During the push into Iraq, there was a convoy, some little logistics convoy that got lost. And um, an Iraqi doctor or somebody saved this group of people and, and this woman in particular at risk to it because he didn't know which way the war was going to go, took on great personal risk. Okay. Her take on this was we were stupid, we got lost, we fucked up. Um, we're not any kind of heroes. We put this, we, we, we get this guy to put his life at risk. That's not how it was played by um, Department of Defense. It, it is this, you know, basically someone saving this damsel in distress. She was pissed about that. Army women were pissed about that. Um, they understood very well that meant that they were being portrayed as liabilities rather than assets. And they had, you know, served too much and, 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 uh, fought too hard and, and in their personal, you know, in their personal careers to make a contribution to have it set it not just like that, just have it turned into someone else's little damsel. Not even their Can damsel narrative, someone else's. There, Jim? Yeah, go ahead. Are you talking about I mean, I, that, that's all basically, those are my points. Uh, go ahead. Are you talking about Jessica Lynch? That's her name. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, she was, uh, she was captured, well, not captured. She was brought to an Iraqi hospital for treatment, and uh, then they made That's this what, whole. Yeah. They made this whole huge. We saved this woman from from I don't know Iraqi right. torture or right. something. And, and, right, yeah, I right, remember right. that she did make a statement where she was not really pleased with what the what the media had done with what happened. But uh, before we continue, I want to do a roll call, and I want to explain who is on board tonight, so the audience is, isn't completely not knowing what the hell is going on. Once again, this is open line, so you can call in and bring whatever you want to the table, and the hosts and co-hosts and guest hosts who are talking, well, me, Allison Tiemann, otherwise known as Typhon Blue. I also have my Star Wars weekly co-host, uh, Hannah Wallen, and uh, we also have our special guest host, Sage Girard. And I also have my uh, co-blogger from Gender Attic, uh, Ginko, or uh, Jim Doyle. And, uh, yeah, he's sort of a special host as well. So those, the, those are the people who are hosting the show. And if you do want to call in, the number is 1-310-388-9709. That's 1-310-388-9709. You don't have to talk to a topic. You can bring any question you have to us, any topic that you want to discuss, you can even troll us if you make it interesting. So please do call in. The number again is one three one zero three eight eight nine seven zero nine. And I'm going to hand the floor to my co-host Hannah, who's been waiting very patiently. Go ahead, take it away, Hannah. Well, a little bit ago, um, we kind of touched on modern gender roles and the, the similarity to prostitution, where um, you know, women sort of trade really just our gender for uh, the right to be supported and taken care of. And it got me thinking, I, we, were, we had this discussion before, I think, um, but I'm not sure it was on the show. As an as a avid reader growing up, um, I had a lot of different favorite books. I, I read a lot because I was a, a asthmatic kid and I wasn't as active maybe as the other kids. One of the series I read was uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder's Little House on the Prairie series, and I remember this chapter where they spent the whole day outside 
mowing down hay, and uh, it was actually a family job. This wasn't something that, you know, today, uh, girls today would have just just dropped their teeth at the level of work that, that Laura Ingalls did as a little girl, where her father um, spent the whole day tossing cut hay up into a wagon, she spent the whole day running back and forth in the wagon on top of this moving hay, stomping it down. And the the story talked about how throughout the day, um, she you know she developed muscle pain. She got tired. Uh, the the wife had to put the mother of the family had to put ginger in the water so that when they drank it, they wouldn't get stomach cramps because they were dehydrated. Um, this was a, this was a level of work this was a level of uh effort that that you don't really see a lot of women putting in today and you don't really see a lot of people taking on today unless they have to um, and and back then it was a have to but i mean when we talk about traditional gender roles and and the idea the the feminist idea of women being in the kitchen and men being at work and being at work being something great and being in the kitchen and being something lousy what we're really doing is kind of ignoring the way things actually were in the past, where everything was hard work. And while men did take greater risk and and men did have to um, exercise superior physical strength and, and greater endurance, I think the women, let's take a look at the pioneer women, were a great deal tougher than your average American woman today. I think your average American woman would just pass out if she tried to to uh, exercise the same level of agency and the same level of responsibility and just the same level of physical effort as as women throughout uh, American history. Yeah, no doubt. And it's, it's funny how uh, how uh, feminists will look back in history and they'll call these women the ones who were oppressed, damseled, and distressed. Uh, you know, who who were had no voice and couldn't take any action. When in many cases, these women were preventing their families from dying. You know, they had all the power of necessity in their hands. Um, and what I mean by that is, in throughout history, um, the home was considered not an, a unit of consumption, but a unit of production. And women would be responsible for producing the, the goods that could keep their family alive. Uh, throughout the year, um, not just not just uh, clothing and, and all those things, but they, they chopped wood, they hauled water, they canned foods, or they prepared foods for winter. You know, it, the idea that women were in any way hypo agents throughout history is possibly one of the most insulting things that feminists came up with. And if, you know, for example, I've used this example before. Um, my husband's great-grandmother cleared a hectare of land with a hand axe. And she engaged in, like you were saying, Hannah, the kind of activities that a woman today would probably whine incessantly about. You know, in fact, there was a, a feminist researcher in my neck of the woods who was interviewing pioneer women. And she, she would talk about the things that they did in the context of it being oppressive to them. Everybody did that work, and yet when they did it, it was oppressive. Yeah, Sage Gerard has just texted me, feminist researcher in quotes. Good good point, yeah. So-called researcher. But uh, anyway, we're going to move on to another caller. Nessanor. Hello. Hi, Hello. you're on the air. Well, well, I just wanted to comment, uh, since Karen's out of town, uh, she's threatened your cats and mine. Karen has Karen? threatened our cats? Yes. Yes, she's talking about making some kind of a video showing just how much of an evil uh, person she is because she wants to put a kitten in a blender. Oh, no, no, no. she's not threatening her cat. That's the metaphorical kitten because, you know, they're uh, all so evil. Was, I mentioned... But uh, am I going to have to use your cat's as defense if she said she'd go through your cat's and mine? Uh, I, you know what? If I think she tried to stuff uh, my big black cat in a blender, the blender would probably break. 
and uh, I, I really doubt that she could. I mean, the cat is uh, the cat is as big as my upper body. I, I don't know how he got that big, but he's a freaking enormous cat. I think he's part lion, so I, I don't think that he has any is any danger of being blended. Well, so that's good. I'm least. not going to worry about him. I'm not uh, going to turn him into a victim or a damsel or or be too concerned. <laughs> He can Damn take care of himself. Oh, good, so. good. Yeah, she, it just worries me. She's just a little bit anti-cat, and it scares me. Um, you, yeah, you know, some people who are allergic tend to get anti-cat because they put off the signals that make cats sort of come towards them, you know, with the oh, pointy eyes. You know, and, and also I've noticed that cats are very, very aware if you're distressed, and if you're distressed because the cat is there, that tends to not really work out very well for human or cat. I guess it's like, <laughs> anyway, because the cat comes towards you and tries to say, oh, you're distressed, I'm going to help you out. But, but of course, the person is distressed because the cat is in the room with them and doesn't want the cat to come closer. But uh, yeah. this is sort of an aside. Um, did but, you have uh, anything else besides cat-related matters? Yeah, yeah actually, I called in because I remember uh, Eric, uh, well, Oh, wait, 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 before you go on. I've just been given a direct at the headquarters. Hannah Wallen says, if you set the blender high enough, will it be a whipped pussy? Oh. Oh, I know, I know, I know. These people, I, I, they're unbelievable. But anyway, go ahead and continue. <laughs> uh, Eric and I were talking one time. Uh, we made some jokes about uh, comparing... Uh, the Star Wars trilogy to feminism, because I remembered, you know, they, these days women are taught to fear men because men might be a potential rapist, they might be a potential assaulter, but men are taught to respect women, which obviously leads to inequality. But the thing that caught my attention was a quote from Yoda, which is, "Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering." And that's exactly what we're seeing right now. Women are taught to fear men, and now they're causing men to suffer. Well, they're causing themselves to suffer, too. Yeah, uh, that's true. The, the reality is, and it sort of goes back to Hannah's point about women being a lot stronger generations ago, I think they were also a lot freer. Because the reality is you can give a person all the legal rights and freedoms as you want, but as soon as you put them in a cage of fear, they might as well not have any. So well, that's kind of what happens in the U.S. right now anyway. Yeah, oh, my God, there might be men. terrorists. <laughs> but you do it to men and you do it well. They do it to women and they do it to men. and it's Yeah, it's, it's, nobody's happy, I think. Um, I think feminists are the least happy of all. Which and, is, yeah, but that kind of points out. It kind of points out feminism is the dark side. Yeah, feminism is. It's the. Uh, sorry, Canada just texted a really awful another. You guys, I can't. I'm uh, sorry, I can't understand your accent. Oh God! All right, I'm not going to read you your guys' comments anymore because you're distracting <laughs> the hell out of me. And your puns are terrible, terrible puns, terrible. Oh, yeah. No, well, that's some... okay. She's just a little chicken, and she's uh, giving you poultry jokes. <laughs> I know, they're foul. <laughs> <laughs> Why? All I wanted to do today was have a nap, but now I'm here on this radio show being bombarded by bad puns. What, All are right. you going to send them okay. to the penitentiary? <laughs> God. This is so punishing. It's punishing. Okay, all right. Yeah, feminism is, is if it's not the dark side, then it's definitely the fear side. Mm, I just see the dark side is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, did you have anything else you wanted to add, Nefinor? No, no, just listening as usual. <laughs> I swear to God, they're trying to—they're trying to make me screw me up with these things now. Okay, all right. Well, thank you, Nevinor. Also, thank you to California guy. We didn't get a thanks in before you disappeared into the night. I'm gonna go now to Monty. He wants to talk to us about punitive father registries. Monty, you're on the air. 
Right. Um, putative father registries, most people don't know what they are. Um, but basically, 33 states uh, have a law by which uh, they will approve an adoption with the consent of the mother and without the consent of any father if uh, if your consent is to be required for your child to be adopted, you have to um, either be married to the mother or you have to comply with the putative father registry requirement. Um, these can vary significantly from state to state. Um, so in some states even you have to... Uh, file for a paternity suit. You have to basically um, put yourself out there as the father and file a suit uh, to try and establish paternity. If that suit is not answered, um, but then the woman decides to keep the child, you've just basically roped yourself into child support. Um, you'll be stopped from, uh, from denying your paternity once you've already claimed it in a lawsuit. Um, this can be, well, it's kind of a nightmare uh, for a very, very small number of guys out there. Um, and this doesn't get talked about much by anybody, not not even in uh, in the men's rights movement because it's, it's such a tiny little issue. It, it so rarely happens. But to me, it's um, it's always been emblematic of kind of all the other things that uh, that we are talking about here. Um, and the reason uh, I've been looking at this here lately is uh, there's a law that's just passed the, uh, the state house in Ohio that will reduce the cutoff point for a man to register from uh, from one month after his child's birth to one week. Um, and there's some some language in the bill that uh, that also uh, it talks about uh, giving advance notice prior to the birth to uh, the putative fathers or to anyone who the mother identifies. Um, but ultimately, if you're the actual birth father, if you're the biological father. You're not guaranteed anything by that, so there's there's no trade-off in this bill. And I, I came across an article from a, uh, a representative up there who had uh, he was supporting this bill, and I found what he he portrayed it as though there was a trade-off that, that these guys would start getting advance notice, and then they would have a longer time. And if you are a putative father. And, or if uh, the mother identifies you, then you do actually get 30 days from the time that they give you your notice. Um, so if she chooses to exercise this uh, this pre-birth option, then you will get a full 30 days, uh, even if that goes past the seven days after the birth. But if she just wants to cut you out... Um, then it becomes very easy for her to do so. Um, and I've, I've been emailing with the staff of this legislator up there um, trying to get some answers, and uh, the arguments that they have sent me back have been um, predictably irrelevant for the most part. Um, so basically... Uh, when I ask about, you know, what kind of rights are fathers going to have under this, they say, well, putative fathers get this and this and this. Well, it doesn't matter if you're a putative father. First of all, you have to be a biological father anyway. Um, and then uh, I get a little bit of, well, you know, guys are on notice from the moment that they have sex with a woman that, well, you're really not on notice that, the woman you just had sex with is going to give your baby up for adoption uh, nine months down the road. Um, and there's, like, there doesn't have to be any sort of event that puts you on that notice. 
to get you excluded. And it's a it's a complicated issue because, as I say, it, it is really rare for any guy to actually be hit by this. Usually, if if, uh, if your girlfriend's giving up your baby, you probably aren't in the situation anyway. You probably don't want it anyway. Um, and that's what usually happens. But what we tell these guys in these very rare cases where they stand ready and willing and able to take care of their own child is basically how can you possibly be a parent? You're not even a woman. Um, and yeah, now that there's point. not a woman out there who says she wants you to be a parent. And it's interesting how they yeah, never really apply the same logic to the fact the woman's giving up the baby. Go ahead, Hannah. And this, this really boils down to um, it, 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 it is a complicated issue, and it is, I'm, I'm not simplifying the issue itself, but the philosophy or the thought process behind it really boils down to the idea that, that the question, should we, as a society, place more responsibility for a child's welfare on a child's father than we do on the child's mother and give, you know, <laughs> a, afford the mother more right to her autonomy over and above the child's auton- autonomy and the, and the child's welfare than we do the father. And at that this point, that's what we're doing. The mother has all of the all of the rights that that you can take and say, well, even though it might impact on other people, you can do this. And then the father has all of the responsibilities where you're going to turn around and say, well, because it's going to impact other people, we demand this. And that, that's the way it's set up with child support. That's the way it's set up with custody. That's the way it's set up with everything to do. Visitation, they work the father's schedule around around the mother's convenience. Um, and, 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 of course, fathers get get custody very little of the time, and they are assigned child support almost all of the time. And right. Ohio does something that um, I don't know how, how the other states handle this, but if uh, really the, the parents do not get an opportunity to make a, a, a agreement on this on their own, um, at any if at any point the custodial parent, who is usually the mother, ends up in a bad financial situation and and makes use of the welfare system, the moment the mother makes use of the welfare system, regardless of any agreement she and the father may have had. Uh, as long as she's got physical custody, um, primary residential custody of the child, even if they've even yeah, they got yeah. a shared parent yeah. agreement, the state will go after him for child support. Uh, so, I mean, this is a situation where um, all of the responsibility really is dumped financially, is dumped on the father. And then for the state to turn around and pass something like this, which really this law you're talking about is, a, an adoption facilitation law. What they've done is they've made it much, much easier for women to hide a birth from a father so that they can sneak the baby through an adoption process before he can have the legal right to to go for custody. And and that is basically, you know, the the situation is they've got these fathers, you know, over a barrel. They are going to be scared to claim uh, parental status because the mother may have custody and they may be stuck with a child support bill. And Ohio does something else that I, I don't know about a lot of other states, but this is specific to Ohio, and I know this because it was done to my family. They don't necessarily base a, a child support obligation on what the law says the child support obligation is based on. If you go into uh, the Child Support Enforcement Agency and they set up a child support obligation, they'll base it on whatever they want to base it on. And if you go to court to remedy that, judges in in some counties in Ohio, many counties in Ohio actually, will base it on what they think the father should be earning rather than what he actually is earning. And if anything that the father does is not um, up to par with the judge's standards, if his job is not good enough, if he gets laid off, if he gets a reduction in hours, his company closes anything, it's his fault. If uh, 
if the mother does any of those things, it's still his fault. So, once again, this is a situation where, you know, these guys are are going to be afraid to step up um, unless they're certain that they're going to, to step into the child's life. And so that, you know, where a woman, when she gets pregnant, she may have a few months to make a decision. She has nine months to make a decision on, on uh, adoption. Yeah, they're, they're actually giving the guy, like, a week, which pretty much, like, like you said, that is, is almost a personification of men's rights issues because what it basically boils down to, again, is all the responsibility on men, all of the rights to women. That's very true. And I remember uh, talking to a feminist a while back, and they asserted that men had the same ability to give a child up for adoption. So men already have the legal option of, uh, of paternal surrender in their, in their worldview. And I said that if, uh, if men had the same custody and surrender options as women, or if we reverse the sexism, if men had the current surrender options and custody options that women have, as soon as a woman dropped her child off at anywhere, or dropped his child, because it would automatically, if he has his her custody rights, it would, everyone would consider his child, not only would she not be getting out of child support, she would probably be facing kidnapping charges. And it's like you cannot say that men have the same custody rights because they, in, in the case of adoption, unmarried fathers, in the case of children being adopted, they do not have the same custody rights. They just don't. They have to go to court to establish those custody rights. That costs an incredible amount of money, and they have no assurance that they'll actually win. If they had the same custody rights as the mother, as soon as the mother dropped the baby off, the baby would be handed to the father, and the mother would probably be up on kidnapping charges. So it, there is no parallel there. And uh, But I wanted to thank Monty for, for bringing that up, and it's a very good topic, very, very important topic. And we're going to move now to Summerfield. Summerfield, you're on the air. Hello. Hi. Um, I'd like to say hello to everyone. Uh, Allison, Karen, who's not there, everyone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and because, Hannah. Uh, and and Hannah and Victor Zen and and uh, and James. your co your co host Kinko and James. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's everybody. Of course, uh, okay. Kinko had to had to drop out, but uh, hopefully he'll be back next week. So go ahead. What what did you have to? Where did you want to take the show? Um, well, I want to really quick thank you all for existing. I mean, when I first found out about a year ago now about all of this, when when the scales fell fell in my eyes, to quote Karen, gender bummed me out <laughs> for mm-hmm. quite a long time, but your existence has helped me get over that mini depressive episode. Um, and to just say, and it was good timing, there was an article um, on it was Slate today about, and it was about a Wellingsley College and a tempest in a teapot with feminists. It seems to um, exemplify everything that you've been talking about for months now, but I don't know if you've heard about this. There's a exhibit at a museum there, and they have a statue called Sleepwalker, which is a very realistic statue. Well, have you heard about that yet? Yes, I have heard about it. <laughs> and it's just, it reminded me of the kerfuffle in Vancouver with Thornton Park, where they were planning to put a warm a memorial for dead Irish people next to a memorial for um, 12 women, and there was this whole brouhaha over the horrors of having a phallic monument anywhere near their carved vaginas. Um, And in New York a year ago where they took down a statue called Civic Virtue of a male slaying two Valkyries to show society triumphing over um, over adversity. a, A man slaying Medusa. Oh, the Medusa? I, I thought it was a Valkyrie. Medusa makes it worse. <laughs> mm. 
And um, I thought I thought that statue was was uh, uh, one of the Greek heroes slaying Medusa, not Valkyries. But go on. Well, and it's just the whole thing. And I'm sorry, I'm rambling a little bit. But no, one of the I things that struck that struck me was that in all of these comments, by a quarter of the student body is Wellingsley you know, in their feminist rage, trying to have this statue of a man removed because it's blindly trampling over their female landscape and it's just the ownership of the world that that embodies and the fact that to maintain their own sense of victimhood they're literally stating that a statue has agency in and of itself (laughs) I mean some of the comments that they have made they, they, they literally say that the statue itself has agency, and claiming it doesn't is trying to excuse its behavior just like all the other rapist men in the world. And the fact <laughs> that... I know. No, and actually, the fact, Hannah just texted another freaking pun. I guess it was the statue of limitations. Ah. Uh, Feminist limitations. Oh. <laughs> but it's... it's uh, yeah, it's, it's incredible that... The, the, and the reality is that they're saying that the statue has more agency than they do. Exactly. And it's like, how how far do you have to go? Male, It's a literal object, but it's male-bodied, so it has to have more agency than you, and that agency has to be threatening. And also, real quick, I wanted to say, the director of that museum, her name is Lisa Fishman, or I believe it's Fishman. I really hope I'm not mispronouncing that. But and note 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 on her gender. Most of their con- she tried to rebut them, and she sent in an email trying to explain the purpose of the exhibit and everything. And all of their attacks against her just assumed her maleness. And I'm not sure if they were assuming that because she disagreed, or because accusations of maleness are their default attack form. It's just crazy I hey um I wanted to actually ask a question here what is this uh if if a statue can have agency how does this tie into the objectification narrative I mean this is uh, to, this kind of this makes no fucking sense I mean we're ta- I want on one hand we're looking at uh we were looking at women talking about human beings being objectified in terms of their sexual appearance, but now we're looking at something that is an object and actually giving it power by virtue of it being an object. What is the consistency behind all this? There is none. And I, I'm, this is this is bizarre. Um, in fact, I was uh, wanting to um, – I was just thinking not too long ago, like uh, if we're going to be talking about – uh, feminists complaining about objectification in terms of women being viewed at, in, in terms of their sexuality, I was going to come back and say, yeah, well, explain dildos. But now, apparently, that argument's not going to fit anywhere because apparently dildos have agency. What the fuck is going on? I know. I mean, and if, if, all, if all PID, penis in vagina, is rape, then what are women doing with those dildos? Uh, well, it's uh, it's it's quite the, right. it's quite the uh, the rat's nest of uh, rationalizations. I would say to Sage that the the um, I think the consistency, what the underlying point is that whatever it is, a woman is a victim. Hannah, go ahead. Well, that's that pretty much what I was going to say. Um, the only other thing I would add is the difference in feminist perception related to body image, where women, when you show women's bodies in, in any sexualized, um, as to use their word, any sexy way, um, they call it objectification, they want to call it victimization of women, specifically victimization of the individual being shown. But as soon as a man's body is shown in a way that is sexy is, um, well, as soon as a man is on exhibit in any way, they want to treat it like it's an attack on women. They want to treat it like his his body is somehow, um, you know, malicious 
and and uh, dirty and and scary. So it's it's right back to that whole um, you know man bad woman good um, male power woman you know women are victims. It, it's right, it goes right back to that complete lack of uh, female agency and the, the almost the hyper agency when it comes to men is that the idea that they are everything they do is an attack. Yeah. It's always women pretty much the only consistency is that women are always a victim of men somehow. Well thank you for that, Summerfield. We're gonna move now to Andrew talk um Andrew who wants to talk to us about Earl Silverman. Andrew, you're on the air. Oh hello there. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. You're a little bit muffled but Oh that's fantastic. Um, I just listened to um, Dean Esme interviewing um, Barry Williams of the Lone Star Foundation, and in the interview they said that there's no um, refuges for men in America or Canada and now in Australia because Australia had one and it closed down. And I was just um, really wanting to, to let people know that I haven't forgotten the old Silverman and I really want um, to try and start a refuge in my country and to help other refugees start it. Okay, so is that all you wanted to say about that topic? Or? No, um, I think it's a really important issue for men and their children because um, most marriages now do end um, in divorce or you know, most families do break up and there's all the support for women but there's really no support for men. And feminists like to look at statistics and they say, well, if 50% of politicians aren't women, it's discrimination. So therefore, if 50% of um, money aren't, isn't going to mean that it must be discrimination too. <laughs> yeah, but you see, the thing is that the you know, it's it's compensating for the patriarchy. So yes, you know. and and um, but, but the problem is is that the patriarchy has never been proven to exist. Like in history, there's been female queens and female rulers who've done horrible things to women as well. Well, yeah, the uh, patriarchy of feminist imagining has never been proven to exist. That's very true. Um, and I don't even think they think they, they need to prove it. They just know that women are victims and men are the cause. So they don't need anything more to justify why men don't get the same services as women. It's as simple as that. It's, you can't, if you try to look for an understanding in it, there yes, is Yes, I nothing. totally agree with you. If a woman says that it must be true, and... I remember reading about um, Tsarina Catherine, the Catherine of Russia, and she forced women to um, kill their babies. This woman and her, her personal staff had babies. She had forced them to go drown them. Okay. Yeah, there's, you so know, that's, like that's the... That's an example of a woman oppressing woman. Well, <laughs> like a better... Well, you know, I said that's just one woman, but we have an entire movement that really is about no matter how many legal rights and entitlements the government gives women, as long as feminism promotes uh, an atmosphere of fear, you know, it's like the, it's like the, the parable of the, the um, elephant with the pig. You know, if you train an elephant from the time it's a baby, uh, you put it on a pig with a, with a chain, a really deep, from the, the time it's a baby, when it grows up, it can be held by just a rope on a peg, you know, a gigantic elephant being held by a rope with a with a tent peg at the end. You know, it's it's fear is is a cage, and that's what feminists are doing to women, and they do not care that they're doing that to women. I mean, if we're going to talk about the negative effects on women, which it's parallels what you're talking about, Catherine the Great, but they don't care. They don't care, and uh, because the end goal is not helping women, it's hurting men. Yes, I, I believe that's correct. Yes, I have heard about the elephant and how after a while the elephant just gives up struggling against the, the thing on its legs. So you can put a rope or even some, some tiny thing and the elephant won't struggle. And you're right, mm-hmm. I do feel that feminism isn't um, out to help women. I do feel that many, many radical feminists do just want to hurt men and want to change society. Like Harriet Harman um co-author the paper saying that the new family is only going to be women and children and obviously little girls and boys not having a father does hurt women and it hurts men as well. 
Well, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm like the reality is that feminism has such a dark underbelly. They even have uh, they have radical feminists who would kill me. Like, uh, I don't know of any men's rights activists, extreme or otherwise, who said that they would kill women like me. Like, kill them, round them up, and put them in gas chambers because we uh, we we would be perpetuating the patriarchy according to to radical feminists. So I'm supposed to, it, it's for, they say that I am so I have Stockholm syndrome or somehow I'm forgoing my own benefit by throwing my my lot in with a group of people who've never talked about killing me. I should be throwing my lot in with a group of people that have an unacknowledged dark side that talks about killing people like me. You know, I, 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 in terms of my own benefit, I would prefer to 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 stay as far away as possible from the group of people that has a subset that wants to kill me. You know, it, it's like I, I, that's just self-preservation talking. So, no, thank you, feminists. Until you scrub those people from your movement, um, I don't want any part of it. And and, and it's not even – well, it is a situation where they're, they're horrific to men and they're bigoted towards men, but they're also bigoted towards women like me. Where's the benefit in being a feminist if I'm going to be – if I'm going to be indirectly supporting women who want to kill me by sharing the same name label with them. Sorry? Yes, and I remember Erin Pizzi said that um, it was actually a woman who drove her, her out of London and drove her out of her house that she started, her shelter. So um, where are these women, where's their support for other women if they did that to her? Sorry, could you repeat that? The muffling oh, I'm sorry. I, I remember Erin Pizzi saying it was actually women, it was feminists who drove her out of London. They threatened her and I think they killed her dog. And that just shows you that women don't care about other women, they just care about um, their philosophy that men are evil and must, we must only support women who, who are suffering domestic violence. Yeah, well, only support women who believe their ideology. <laughs> and uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's not to my benefit to support a group of people that has a a hard, crazy, genocidal core that wants to kill me. But, you know, just cost-benefit analysis, I just set aside, even setting aside men's rights, you know, I don't want to support feminism because of that. And then there's also the men's rights issues, which are huge for me, of course, obviously. But... (laughs) Yeah, so it's, it's, yeah, I don't think feminists really have anybody's interests in mind except their own and the interests of, of perpetuating their ideology. And you really can't, I mean, you can, you can look at their leaps in logic and just shake your head, but trying to understand them, um, well, they, there is no logic there. There's just emotion. Women are victims, men are to blame, and that's it. That's correct. You- and, um, Sometimes I, I watch the afternoon talk shows to try and understand how, how feminists think because many of them have feminists on as guests a lot of the time and um, I, I can't really see much logic to, to what they say on these talk wait, shows. Wait. It's all, yes, it's I'm all sorry, women I'm are sorry. victims. I'm sorry, did you say feminists think? No, <laughs> I, I, I can't see any evidence of any thinking at all. It's all just emotional, sort of like fear-based sort of rhetoric. No, that's exactly what it is. It's just bigotry. I mean, there's no point trying to understand the logic to bigotry because it's just emotional thinking. Well, I'm going to thank you for for your call, um, Andrew. Oh, um, thank you. And I appreciate calling, calling again. And I'm going to move now to Nightwing. Nightwing, you're on the air. Hello, Nightwing. Nightwing. Okay, Nightwing apparently does not want to talk, so we're going to move to Fatherless. Fatherless, you're on the air. Hello, Honey Badgers. Hello, Ginger Badger. (laughs) Um, He's our uh, our cis ginger. Yeah, the cis ginger, that's right. (laughs) Uh, Very good. The cis wonder. Um, I wanted to talk about the first feminist who asked... Uh, a question at um, at, Tri- at Ryerson today, um, the one who was talking about how every place on campus is a male-safe uh, place. 
Um, if anyone, if any feminist is listening, I, I wanted to um, express my admiration for that girl to come out and ask sort of an oppositional question. Um, you know, because you could actually hear the the fear in her voice, uh, and she was trembling when she was asking her questions. But you know, she wasn't actually in an unsafe place, uh, and I can almost guarantee. So, so I, how do I say this? I admire her for going into a place that she thought was not necessarily safe, even though that was an erroneous, um, you know, perception. Um, but I hope that her feeling that it was unsafe doesn't make her walk away from that place just con- setting her ever deeper into her own biases, even though I can almost guarantee that if anybody, you know, tried any violence against her, any number of those men would have stepped forward to stop it. You know, but there, but her, well, her the content of her ideas was certainly not safe. You know, in a in a conversational sense. Yeah. Um. On that note, um, just recently I had the uh, I hosted the first meeting for Kennesaw State University men over in my neck of the woods, and um, I was told to expect a feminist presence. Um, and what ended up happening was a feminist came by. And when she came up, she had very reserved body language. She uh, lo- she looked like she was scared to be there. And um, you know, we're talking arms crossed, leaning away. And um, it actually, I actually did welcome her to the meeting anyway, since it was public. And after a right. conversation, she felt you know more comfortable. But I think that um, I mean, I, I was glad that somebody came. I mean, it's good to have somebody there. But I really don't think that. Um, I really don't think that I, I think I'm gonna disagree with you in one respect, such that I wouldn't really commend the courage if the fear wasn't justified. And I really do think that um yes, the content of the idea would not have lasted very long because the, it, there's a very strong level of disagreement, but I don't think anybody's going to be uh taking on the patriarch stereotype and going forward to oppress her or actually treat her as anything less than a human being. And um, I really, I mean, it's, I mean, I understand what, what you're getting at. It's it's just that I don't think that, uh, I just don't think that feminists are in a situation where if they speak out, people are going to hurt them. It's, no. um, I mean, society is just not going to be like that. And no, I think ab- that it's absolutely not. Yeah. But w- what so, I'll yeah, say um, though is the first time I rode my bicycle, I was terrified, you know, um, but eventually I got to the point where I could do all sorts of crazy stunts on my bicycle and not worry, you know? Um, now I don't, I'm not so naive as to think it's going to be a big happy hold, hand holding kumbaya, you know? But I think the more times that you engage in dialogue with people and you realize that they're not just going to shut you down and, um, and so forth that, you know, you can... It challenges well, um, the notion of what MRI stand, MRI stand for in the first place. Yeah, one thing, one other story I want to give you is um, I went also on KSU. I attended a uh, event where um, there were there were two very prominent feminists that came in to do a do a, do a speech, and uh, these were uh, Dr. Crenshaw and Dr. Sheftal. And these feminists were one, the first one, Dr. Crenshaw, coined the term intersectionality, and Dr. Sheftal was the one who uh, started the uh, first black women's studies courses, or, or first women's studies course in a historically black uh, university. So very big names. And I was obviously the only MHRA there. And I wasn't scared to be there, but I certainly wasn't going to speak up because I'm sure I would have been nailed to a cross. Um, so I think that that it is true that somebody might feel very tense, very um, uh, very afraid of uh, speaking up in those circumstances. But I think that a lot of these barriers to communication are created by people ruminating in their own little bubbles, and they end up never actually going out to communicate with people in the first place. And when these feminists came to speak, they actually said, you know, we were glad that we got this safe space to have this talk. And I was just thinking to myself as I was sitting there, what is going to happen to you if you were to speak anywhere else? Nothing's going to happen to you. Nothing's going to – no one's going to hurt you. No one's going to treat you badly. And 
I think that the only people that would ever get in their faces about anything are maybe somebody in South Africa because Dr. Crenshaw was one of the people behind the South African Constitution and maybe she has political enemies of the air. But I just got, it kind of got me thinking. I think that we really are in a spot where people have been very scared of one another according to conversational barriers. But I think that if there's anything to commend about the girl that you're uh, that you that you were talking about at the beginning of this um, your your call, it's that she is finally looking at uh, she's finally one of the people that's at least talking without going to pull a fire alarm or <laughs> going for the shut the fuck up and let me read my list approach. So sure, yeah. So if you're if you're not going if there's actually questions going on, I think that. It's a step towards civility, and that is certainly something to commend. Well, and I'll see. I'll 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 admire her for coming up and asking a question and talking and confronting her fear. But what I won't do is think that that's enough, because what she has to do now is go home and and think about the experience. And um, is it going to occur to her that her fears weren't justified? That's that's the next step. We don't know. And I, if if anyone's listening and can. You know, I want to send it out there. She should think about that, you know. Um, she was able to say what she wanted to say. Well, that's another thing I wanted to point out. Um, everything that she said was a repeat of an existing feminist talking point. She did well, not sure. say anything that... I mean, this is this is a consistent thing with a certain segment of the grassroots of the feminist movement where... Um, they don't really do much of anything except pick up talking points from other feminists and repeat them. And I don't know, I, you know, I, I don't know this girl. I haven't seen anything else she did besides stand up and spout talking points at Karen. So I don't know whether that was a fluke with her or that was par for the course. But um, as far as courage was concerned, uh, I, I think where you can say she does have courage is that she was not, confrontational she she did something different than than uh feminists have been doing regarding that type of venue um where she spoke peacefully but but the fact is that what she brought up wasn't really anything of substance and it, it, she and the next girl after her both really did the same thing um talking point you know posed as a question and then when Karen answered that masterfully, I might add, um, they would spout the next talk. They didn't even uh, address what she said. They would just spout the next talking point as if it was an argument against the previous one. Uh, this is something that we see on Reddit's men's rights all the time, and it's called moving the goalposts. Oh, you beat that one? Okay, well, we're going to throw this one out on you. Oh, you beat that one? Okay, well, we're going to throw this one out on you. Oh, oh, you beat that one? Well, we're going to say this about objectification. And and it goes on like that sometimes for, for several comments. And, and in a situation like that, it might go on for several minutes, except that the moderators um, did put a, put a sort of put a stop to it with each one and move on to the next one. Okay, I think so in other another... words... Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I, I just want to inter interject one quick thing. I think that um, when we're talking about uh, the moving the goalposts, I think this is one of those artifacts that comes from ideological conversation. And uh, <clears throat> when you're looking at I, – I see this a lot when people argue semantics about the definitions of ideologies. I mean, the problem is this is, this is all normative. This is all based on human motivations. And if somebody's out to justify an ideal – Frankly, you could go ahead and just redefine your position on the fly because if somebody's criticizing something, then obviously it's not an ideal anymore. So you could just easily ignore the criticism and equivocate to look like you're not committing to anything that the criticism applies to. And I call this being a chicken shit, but other people think of it as actual argument. But um, that's, that's pretty much all I wanted to say about that. I really don't think that uh, – Go, going with moving goalposts, as Hannah was talking about, is anything that um, I would I would describe as intellectually honest, but that, that is what it is, I suppose. Um, I wanted to add another thing, the direct response to what that feminist said about all spaces being men's safe spaces. So what she's essentially asserting is 
that all spaces in the world are spaces where male safety and comfort is prioritized. Yeah, I wish that girl could have been there when I was at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology working in the Human Resources Department for a minute, and a woman threatened to chop my dick off if I didn't do a particular piece of paperwork correctly. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's absurd. There are, is there, where are the spaces where men's safety is prioritized? Like, where are the spaces where women are expected to jump in front of a bullet for men? Yeah. You know, there's, there's, no, there's no space where men are told, well, you know, you get to decide the emotional landscape of this area. You get to decide what you're comfortable with, what you want to see in the morning, uh, you know, when you go to work. And uh, if, if there's a woman with her ass crack hanging out with a thong on, you get to say, hey, lady, that's visual harassment. I don't want to see it when I'm trying to get my coffee and, and do my, you know, <laughs> enter a data in the computer. You know, you get to yeah. say, you don't get to tell me that, you don't get to threaten with chopping off one of my sexual body parts when you want me to do something. You know, where is the, where is the location where men get to set the moral and emotional tone of an environment? And women have to abide by it. That's a man's space. That would be a male safe space. And I can tell that woman that it doesn't exist in the greater world. Women are not expected to to make themselves change themselves for men's comfort. They're not expect what you know. They're not expected to moderate their speech so men don't get offended. They're not expected to avoid touching men because men have the right to their own personal space. You know, it's, these things are not expected of women. It, it's this, well, it's, it's like this, uh, I mean, throughout history, there's always been this idea that, that women get to judge men's behavior. A man is being fresh, you know, she can flap him, that kind of stuff. You know, and that, that's, that means that men are always, always beholden to women's opinions of them. So in the idea that there's a, that the world is a man's safe space, that a world is is where men expect to be emotionally accommodated. So if they're uncomfortable, you know, if they have to walk across a puddle, a woman is supposed to take off her jacket and lay it down so a man doesn't get his 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 expensive leather shoes wet. You know, it, this doesn't. What world does this woman live in? So and, and that's my that's my con that's my reply to that. And uh did you do you have anything else to add to the old folder list before before we say our goodbyes? No, I don't want to hog up the, the call. Well, Thank you. Thanks for thanks for calling in and thanks for bringing in that uh that question and the insight. And uh we're gonna move now to Jeff. Jeff, you're on the air. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So I I attended uh, Karen's talk this evening, and, uh, of course, the act of traveling there and all that means I've missed some of the show, so uh, please feel free to stop me if I'm repeating something that somebody else who's uh, been there has already talked about. Sure. Actually, I'll be sure to do that. But I don't think nobody's so, uh, really talked about it much at all, so go ahead. Uh, Fair enough. Uh, well, I mean, first of all, just sort of general impressions. Uh, the talk was very well attended. The uh, room that was booked at uh, Ryerson was more than full. I had people standing at the back uh, and had to divert a number of people to the overflow room downstairs watching on the monitor. So uh, it obviously generated a lot of interest. And uh, I, I must confess some small amount of disappointment that uh, the woman known as Big Red did not come to protest, at least not that I saw. Yeah, she's oh, it was, almost like uh, a, she's probably, almost like it was a, probably too cold for her. She's <laughs> almost like a she's almost like that uh that 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 crazy aunt, you know, that you, you sort of don't want to come to the family con, but it but their but her antics are so hilarious that it's just it's sort of it's, it's mixed feelings. Well, it, not just mixed feelings, but it, it drew a lot of attention to the uh, Warren Farrell talk at U of T, and I think, if anything, uh, it probably provided a lot of positive attention for his talk and, and for the 
equality movement and for cafe and what have you, because, you know, this woman's behavior attracted uh, mainstream media attention to a subject that was otherwise kind of obscure. But uh, I didn't see any protesters at all uh, of any kind. I mean, there were signs put up saying, you know, no bullhorns, and there were uh, rules against placards and what have you. But uh, none of that was, none of that seemed to take place. And nobody pulled the fire alarm. So, mm. well, it was relatively un, uh, uneventful aside from Karen, you know, having a great talk, essentially. Yes, I think. I'd say she spoke quite well, and there was a lot of time for questions and answers. And, uh, well, lots of people got up to ask questions. If I heard correctly, you were talking uh, just a few minutes ago about the uh, person who spoke claiming that uh, everywhere is a male safe space and making points about cat calls. Did I get yep. that right? Yep. Uh, so... Uh, that ends, that part sort of sticks out a, a bit in my mind uh, in that I mean, it was obvious that she wanted to speak against Karen's message. Um, but I think what's really important is that she was in the room to listen to it and that even though it, it may have been just sort of a litany of talking points and uh, not an honest attempt to have a meaningful debate, uh, the fact that there was somebody in the room to uh, to say those things means means Karen's message is attracting attention. It means people are listening and that people care. I think um, Karen really hit the nail on the head when she talked about debating feminists and that you you really don't debate feminists to uh, change the feminist mind. Uh, and that that particular talking point is a uh, direct target mar- marginalization talking point. It's really designed specifically to marginalize men and and men's issues. Um, calling everywhere in the world a male safe space it isn't just a fat load of bullshit. It's it's willfully ignoring. Um, everything pretty much that that men face in in favor of focusing on women. And so this was a you know this was a direct effort at basically making making these guys in the room feel less manly for being there and and feel you know this was like a shaming tactic. Um and I think she handled it very well. Um I think Karen handled it very well. But as as far as uh, debating her and everything goes, it is great that she was there to bring that up, but not so much for the idea that she was going to listen and learn, um, learn from it, but for the fact that it gave Karen the opportunity to uh, contradict that statement so beautifully, especially um, especially the way she did taking from the story that was told right before it and pointing out, hey, if this exists, if this happens, when a six-year-old girl knows that she can walk up and hit people um, and and not face any retaliation, how do you consider that not oppression? And so and that was just, that was basically all I wanted to say about that. Well, I I agree certainly, and uh, it's acknowledged that in a debate, it's almost never that you're going to convince the other debaters that uh, your position is right, and they're going to admit that they're wrong. Uh, Bill Nye recently debated Ken Ham, the creationist, and I don't think anyone went into this with the expectation that at the end of it, one of the debaters was going to say, you know what, I've been wrong all this time, you're correct but it's about convincing those undecided people and the observers. And uh, like you say, the questions gave Karen a great opportunity to bring up some points, which she hadn't really touched on in her talk. Which uh, Exactly. It's always about the uh, secondary benefit about um, convincing the people around you as opposed to, because the feminists won't ever be convinced. I recently got into an argument with a feminist on my channel about, uh, it was on my video um, 
uh, fem, uh, men's rights versus feminism explained using magnets. And uh, he, he was essentially saying that I would never be convinced that feminism is a good thing, um, even if feminism had caused uh, the, the number of women in uh, STEM, uh, science, technology, mathematics fields to increase fourfold. I would never be convinced that, that feminism was a good thing as a result of it. And I said to him, well, the reality is that women's participation has declined since the 80s. So does that convince you that feminism is a bad thing? And of course, he just glossed right over that because it doesn't, it, nothing is going to convince the true believers that feminism is a bad thing. I mean, even if you explain to them very clear, clearly and slowly how feminism harms women, just let, just set aside how it harms men. Explain to them how it harms women. They're not going to be convinced because it's not about helping men or women. It's about maintaining the ideology. And at that point, all you can do is just argue in such a way that people outside of the argument who aren't feminists see it for what it is. And uh, I want to thank you, Jeff, for 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 your call. And please do call thank you for having me in on. the future. And uh, we're going to move now to Night Runner. Night Runner, you're on the air. It's been a while. Hey, guys. Going. It's going well. I got, uh, Sage, I understand that the uh, case I'm meeting was very interesting. Uh, I've been hearing about it for about a week now. Yeah. Uh, she's obviously very impressed with you. She thinks you're a great guy. Well, I, I, I appreciate that, but um, I really don't... Uh, I, she was unfortunately kind of being very selective in what she heard. Um, I did tell her kind of flat out that I was anti-feminist and that, uh, oh, and uh, t- t- uh, Allison is asking, who is she? Uh, she is the feminist who had been talking about coming to the KSU men meeting and had followed up on that promise and has the uh, same woman that came in with closed body language and very uh, worried about the meeting and its affiliation with the Voice for Men. And yeah, I mean, she she got a good impression because I was able to uh, I was able to address her concerns and uh, she could tell that I wasn't the you know the comic book villain that she was expecting me to be. But um, yeah, I I really don't think that it's uh, I I really don't think that she's um, you know actually really interested in what the group is about since uh, she kind of reinterpreted all the things that I said and went back to the experience project and kind of used what I said as a way to confirm her own suspicions about a voice for men, but whatever. Yeah, that's basically what she did. But, yeah, I, I'm glad that she actually showed up. Uh, I'm glad that you got a chance to talk to her. Um, but anyway, um, this whole thing about I've had conversations with a couple of MRAs here lately about women's uh, uh, humanity and that one of our points is that we in the men's rights movement, we always recognize women's humanity where feminists do not recognize men's humanity. Well, this is true, obviously, but I think that that has been part of society's problem all along as far as we attach things to women's humanity that we probably shouldn't. And uh, Here's an example. Children, we don't expect children to behave as adults. Or no, we know they're going to misbehave. They're going to do things that they shouldn't do. And we expect that out of them because they're children. You know, we don't expect a two-year-old to behave like an adult. We expect the two-year-old to throw a temper tantrum and, and pick up something and throw it across the house because it didn't get what it wanted. But we've attached things to women's humanity, and we've we've um, we just sit back and say, well, that's the way women are, and we've got to look over it. Instead of mm-hmm. saying, sitting there going, no, this is, this is unacceptable behavior, and we need to do something about it. We need to we need to hold women accountable, and we we don't do that. 
And so I think when we as MRAs start talking about, you know, uh, this is unacceptable behavior, we're seen as attacking women's humanity. When we're really not, we're just saying, you know, this this behavior and women's humanity are not attached. I, I really do think, yeah, I really do think that the people who would assume that women are above criticism are not actually assuming that women are even human beings. Um, the thing is, it, 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 the, there's just one argument that with perfect form that is um, women are human beings, human beings are imperfect, therefore women are imperfect. And I don't think that for some reason this is controversial – it's somehow controversial that criticizing – why is it about a problem to criticize women? Why is it a problem to hold them accountable for their mistakes? So I do appreciate you uh, expressing that sentiment. It seems like it just – it seems like they – the society feels that we're attacking women's humanity. It'd be like, be like if there was a movement against two-year-olds having temper tantrums. You know, they'd be like, what, what are wrong, what's wrong with you people? Two-year-olds act like that. And society's sitting back and saying, well, what's wrong with you? Women just, that's the way they are. They act like that. Get over it. You know, we, we deal with it. We move on. And it, in effect, it's not seeing women as adults. It's seeing them as children. It kind of reminds me of that. Um, you re- do you remember that uh, video of the guy who recorded his wife having a tantrum in the car when he wouldn't take her to the lake? Oh, Yeah. I, I'm, I'm guessing that's a, that's a lot of what you're talking about, but um, I think um, it, but I think that we're going to need to uh, move on to the next caller soon. We've got a lot of people on the line. Do you have any other things you would like to say before we move on? And no, no, not at all. Uh, thanks, Sage, for uh, for uh, addressing my point. And uh, Honey Badgers, you guys have a great day. Thanks so much, Night Runner. Okay, thank you, Night Runner. We're going to go now to Grumpy Old Man. Grumpy Old Man. Where do you want to take us? How are you doing? Oh, fine. Karen did a uh, fantastic job on there. And one point I want to bring out to our listeners and to, you know, MRAs, um, you know, we talked about a lot of times we're only going to influence those people who are, are not feminists. But a young feminist asked a very good question, you know, what, what about me and, and how does this pertain to me? And Karen answered very well that w- – a lot of these young feminists get into feminism for an ideal, and they don't understand quite what feminism is doing and, and how they are misrepresenting them in a lot of cases. And I think that's an important message that as MRAs and uh, that we need to get out. I just wanted to point that out, and I hope everyone's having a great night. Well, thank you for that call, and thank you for pointing that out. I, I do agree with, um, with what you're saying that uh, women need to understand what feminism really is about and what it's doing and the perception that it's creating of women in the greater world. Uh, I, I actually think that we women are less free now. To a degree, I mean, you, nobody can really take away your agency, but they can certainly feed you a bunch of nonsense about who has real control over your life. And, uh, and it takes a while to to excavate yourself from it. And certainly if you're constantly getting bad advice, uh, for example, what feminists call victim blaming seems to be recognizing that women have agency over their lives and can to a certain extent choose what happens to them, uh, to themselves. And when you get fed all of this nonsense about, about your life, and right now in this current era, women are the ones with the most primary control over their lives. There's nobody else in a woman's life who has more control over her life than she does. And women are told that they have almost no control over their life. When you combine having a person having complete control over their life with being constantly told they have no control. And that's a recipe for misery. So I agree with Karen and I agree with you, comfy old man, that we, that women, young women, need to learn that feminism is not advocating for them; it's only advocating for itself. I'm going to call now to Pine Tree, who wants to bring up something about Karen's talk at Ryerson. Pine Tree, you're on the air. Hey, hi guys. Uh, good day. I just uh, came back from uh, Karen's event, and uh, it it went really well. There was uh, you know really good turnout, 
and the uh, room was packed and, you know, people had to be downstairs. And so Karen did a great job. I mean, she, she really uh, uh, handled this really well. And, uh, you know, there, there was a couple of hecklers, um, not hecklers, but, you know, uh, feminists there. And, um, yeah, we just, you know, one kept saying that, um, you know, the basic uh, things that, you know, uh, that uh, men are really in control in society and there's no need for them to have a place, but women do need it, right? And it's that common argument you just get all the time. And um, it just gets frustrating to to hear this, this stuff being repeated over and over. And, um, yeah, you know, Karen handled it pretty well. And, um yeah, I just I just hope uh, she comes back again. So that's all. I just wanted to mention that. So I I don't really have much else to say. So well, I I think she's probably going to come back. I mean, I I don't I think I mean does. she's yeah. well, she's only in Toronto. Yeah. I think that she's going to eventually have to go back home. So um, you mean yeah. back on the show or? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, like people like Karen are are really needed to give talks because you know what they won't listen to men right i mean when men go up and say the exact same thing karen is saying no one's going to listen but because karen is a woman and she's saying the things people listen right i mean the largest turnout we had tonight was because of karen and you know i'm sure if it was uh, a guy you know talking about men's issues you would have hardly had anyone show up it, it, it always amazes me that in in um in in a lot of big cities I keep saying this over and over. We seem to have more male feminists than even I, I would be. I wouldn't be surprised if there were more male feminists than there were feminists. Do, do, do you know what I'm saying? Or there's a lot of male feminists. Yeah, actually. There. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's yeah. been um, more than a little bit of talk about that, and uh, yeah. there's among uh, well among the honey badgers, there's some suspicion that. The uh, the prevalence of feminism I- I among men is actually more of a, a power fantasy than it is a uh, an intent to help women. Um, and and this is basically you think about it. Feminism is about women giving up their agency today. And whether it was always about that or not, and I I contend that a lot of it has always been that way. But um, that is that is pretty much the bottom line of feminism today. Women give up their agency. Women play the victim. Uh, men are the protectors. Men are the pro- providers. And, and feminists say that men are in control. And that was really the key thing that I wanted to bring up because it's that's one of the biggest lines of bullshit that, that feminism puts out there is that men have control of everything and women are at men's mercy. If you go through and you look at what men who are in positions of responsibility do, those are the positions that feminists call positions of power, um, many of which can be taken away in one day without warning by the electorate, which isn't really a lot of power if you have to be beholden to the electorate which is you know, women act all, not necessarily as a total voting block, but groups of women act as voting blocks to which these men in these positions of responsibility have to appeal. And as a result, yep. in the United States, we have the Violence Against Women Act. We have just, we were just talking about a law passed in Ohio that makes it easier for um, unwed mothers to give their babies up for adoption without uh, letting the father in on the decision at all. Um, this is a, not a situation where men are in control and women are at their mercy. This is a situation where men act for the benefit of women and then feminists bitch about everything they do. Absolutely. And that case about uh, a guy who slipped a pill into the woman, uh, so she wouldn't have an so, so she would have an abortion. He ended up getting 14 years in prison. Did you hear about that case? Shit. Yeah, I've 14 it. years. I didn't yeah, I've, hear the case. I've got, I've got, um, I've got a few things I'd like to throw out on that case. Sorry if I'm speaking out of turn here. Uh, I, um, no, no. I, first, I, I, yeah. For, first off, this this guy was not. 
convicted of the greater charge, okay? The greater charge would have been under the uh, Violence to uh, Newborns Act, if I'm not mistaken, Unborn Victims of Violence Act uh, that was put in place in 2004, okay? Now, the Unborn Victims of Violence Act would have, if you would have been charged under that, would have given him a life sentence for the murder of a seven-week fetus, okay? Um, mm-hmm. Child, fetus, whatever you want to call it. Instead, what he did was he plea deal to mail fraud and a couple of other lesser charges and got the 14 years out of that, okay? So he yeah. could have gotten murder and been sent up for a life sentence with the Unborn Victims of Violence Act. What I find interesting in this is the fact that if he does it, it's murder. If she does it, it's abortion. If uh, And it, what this is telling me is society has essentially told everyone it's only a child, human rights, if the woman says it's a child. That's the exact double standard that we're talking about. Yep, you you hit it. You, hit it. you said that very well, James. And um, yeah, if it's. And, uh, I mean, now I, I will men, tell you. I will tell you that uh, feminists uh, from all over, with with few with a few exceptions. With a few exceptions, feminists from all over were stridently against the Unborn Victims of Violence Act. Stridently against it because they thought that it would introduce language into the legislation that would eventually allow the overturn of Roe versus Wade. So they actually had to write inside the Unborn Victims of Violence Act provisions that would allow women to abort. So abortion could not be charged as murder. Wow, that's very interesting. I, I didn't know about that. That's a, that's a very interesting perspective. But, uh, you know, uh, that being the case, I mean, you know, uh, a, a guy just has no rights at all um, when it comes to reproduction. And it's what I mean, the double standard is so obvious, but, you know, feminists just keep silent about something so important, you know? So it's, it's a lot of hypocrisy out there. But anyway, listen, I'm going to get going. I just wanted to say the event was great. This is the first event. We've got eight more coming from CAFE, and I think 2014 is going to be a really interesting year out of uh, everything. So uh, I look forward to the year and a lot of new progress. Okay, guys, have a great night, okay? Nice to talk to you. Have a good night. Thank you, Pine Tree. All right. And we're going to go now to Travis. Travis, you're on the air. Hey, how's it going, guys? Oh, it's going well. Uh, can you guys hear me well, or am I still off? Do I you're sound good. all right? All right, cool. Oh, you're hey, you um, fine. All right, cool. I've been listening a lot. Of, uh, I guess you guys call yourselves MRAs, right? Men's Rights Activists or Groups? MRGs? Do uh, I say that correctly? Men's Rights Activists, usually, or okay, Men's cool. Rights Advocates. All right, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I also listen to all the feminists, too. And um, from what I noticed, it, it, it appears to me in general that groups like yourselves, feminists, um, you can name uh, Muslim activist groups, atheist groups, Christian activist groups, all these groups, right, that <clears throat> argue and fight amongst themselves and on other groups, I, I see kind of like as distractors. And what I mean by that is that, you know, you would have a feminist would point out that a man um, can do a particular, I don't know, crime, whatever it is, and he won't go to jail for the same amount as a woman. And vice versa for an MRA, that a, uh, a woman can commit a crime and go to jail and get less sentence. And just focusing well, on prison. Just, just, just a second here, Travis. I mean, you can mm-hmm. automatically uh, just 
resolve that by looking at actual statistics. Feminists are not right. basing, get... basing it on their theories, whereas men's rights activists base it on reality. But go ahead. Right. Well, look, that's the thing, though. If you look, if you look at prison statistics, okay. I'm not, I live in the United States. I'm actually near D.C. But um, I'm also a statistician. Um, well, minoring in statistician. My major is geography. But, anyways, um, if you look at the statistics of incarceration rates within the United States, it's not technically really based off of gender. It's morally based off ethnicity. If you're a black well, actually, woman. Actually, Travis, Travis, yeah. the, the statistics that are coming out now say that gender is a greater determinant of the length of, of sentencing than, uh, okay. than, uh, than race. And I can send you some information. The why is it a black woman to go to jail for uh, lower sentencing than a white man? And I can can send you the statistics that prove that. But let's move on to to your overarching question, which I believe that you had. Yeah, my overarching like well observation I noticed that most of these strikes within different groups within society are really distractions. If you if you really think about it, a greater cause because. What really comes down to who has more power, not men, not women, not black, not white. It's who has money, who doesn't have money. I mean, if you really look at it, because you have a lot of these groups who are funded, like, for example, the Tea Party United States are funded by the Koch brothers, okay? And they have legitimate grievances, right? But then what they do is they attack the wrong person that's given them that grievance. So if you look at, like, these crazy laws, like, that appear to be empowering women or appear to be empowering men or appear to be empowering whatever, it's nothing more than this is a distraction to keep us fighting amongst ourselves and not noticing our true opponent, which is the well-to-do. I mean, it's no shocker that the wealth and inequality gap has gone down, or gone up. The average income of a person has gone down. And so when people have a whole population frustrated and angry and they don't know how to ventilate their rage, they look at targets that are convenient to them as opposed to going after the true opponent. Because if you really think about it, I mean, Oprah Winfrey, who's a woman, a black woman, has a way better life than I do. <laughs> Mitt Romney, a white man, ha- has a way better life than I do. And all, both of them have lots of money. And they refuse to, um, how should we say, uh, um, uh, take care of the population, if you will. So I would think that a lot of these problems would go away if we simply just completely remove our our whole entire economic system we have today and go to more of like what's known as a resource-based economy. Um, that would solve a lot of these problems. That's what really well, would solve all these problems. Let me look at it from a, a, a men's rights lens. Right. The reason why these people can acquire a great deal of power is because they can, they can marshal the um, expendability of the men, of the, the, the desire for men to work in order to earn an identity so that they end up having this almost like a, a, a pool of workers who are willing to sacrifice almost every, anything in order to build up their empires. Without those expendable men, without the expendable workers on the, the factory floor, without the expendable um, privates in the army, Without, without the expendable bottom, we wouldn't see those people at the top. So if you challenge the idea that men need to do something in order to earn their worth, you actually change the very substrate that creates these extremely high-ranking individuals. Right, but see, that's the thing, though. There's a problem here with that. Productivity has gone up. In other words, we have been producing more product, X products, we can call them widgets, it doesn't matter, though, across the whole entire spectrum, we have increased productivity. Wages have gone down. Jo- overall jobs have gone down. Why? Because of mechanization. I can, you can give me 10 men, okay, 10 strong, burly men on the assembly line. They're not going to equal to one robot. I know the argument. Oh, the robot, if you have the robot, you need more people to maintain the robot. No, you don't. It increasingly gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so what happens is you have a, a large pool of people. The only job they can get is Walmart, who now are on welfare stamps, who are used to be working on an assembly line. They're not making half of what they used to make. What happens? Well, you know, let's say this one particular individual, his wife decides to leave him because maybe she was a shallow jerk. Um, and, you know, it doesn't make money. She takes half of what he has. And what happens? He turns around and gets frustrated at women. Uh, his wife gets frustrated at his insufficient man, you know, and, you know, both of them have, I guess you could say, legitimate, legitimate um, 
rage. Why would, but wait, 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 wait a second. So what you're saying is that there's a pool of men who are attempting to to earn a sense of worth. I mean, if you if you take away a person's worth, human worth, and say you only get it by earning money, then what happens? People buy that's into these that's structures that's in which their worth is based on their, their ability to earn, and they start to tolerate increasingly unpleasant um, circumstances in order to earn that money. And then the people well, who the can, they use Capital that in order to build their that, empire. That, that, so the, the reality point, is that, that uh, but you know, Ta- Travis, I'm going to have to, to stop you there and, and give our, uh, our, uh, one of our hosts the opportunity to respond. So just just uh, just uh, just just hold off and uh, James, go ahead. Yeah, sure. I'm 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 fairly familiar with the uh, uh, with resource based economies, the theory yeah. behind resource based mm-hmm. economies. Uh, I've taken a look at uh, several different economic models, and so far the only thing that I have seen that will alter the economic model is not going to be a top-down approach. It's going to have to be a bottom-up approach. Uh, we're, not, we're not going to all of a sudden go, oh, well, we're just going to switch over to resource-based economy, and it'll make everything all better. No, it won't. Right. Switching over to a resource-based economy means absolutely nothing unless you begin to look at the human psychology that is driving what we currently have today. Now, we can sit here and we can challenge corporatism. We can sit here and we can challenge the current political uh, zeitgeist, if you will. Okay? Uh, And we we do this on a regular basis. I, I know I do it on AVFM News and Activism all the time. Okay? Right. But I always make a note, and I always let everybody know, that unless you start with the individual man and allow him to explore his own talents, skills, abilities, and work with his own set of limitations in a competitive competitive market within his own area, that none of that matters. So... What we do as part of the men's rights movement, since we need to drag this back on topic, what we do as part of the men's rights movement, okay, is we let men know they have choice. They don't have to be locked in to my design. They don't have to be locked into your design. They don't have to be locked in anywhere. They absolutely have the freedom to decide for themselves what the hell they want to do in life. So bringing up the topics, the the end result topics of things like, uh, well, we need to switch over to a resource-based economy, while it sounds very pretty to some people within the men's rights movement, accomplishes absolutely nothing in the goal of actually freeing men. And noticed not have free men like what you'd expect out of a resource-based economy, but freeing men. So we've got to move toward a point where we actually make objective decisions based in a uh, a philosophical framework that allows maximum freedom for every human on the planet. And we're not even close to that yet. Not even close. Okay, sorry, Travis. I want to thank you for your call, but as you can tell, we're at the end of the hour, and I wanted to try to get the last caller. Nope, actually, we've lost the last caller. So I wanted to thank everybody who's called in, and I apologize to Travis that we had to cut him off, but, again, we have four minutes left to the show, and uh, these kind of arguments can last forever, and we need to, to start the conclusion to our show. So it's that time again. I'm going to ask my co-hosts to put in their last two cents. Hannah, did you have anything that you, some final thoughts on anything that was talked about during the show? Well, on basically on the last statement, um, because that's the most recent thing, 
I, I just uh, have to point out, when we talk about different ways of um, interacting with the economy, different economic systems, the one thing that we seem to forget in the middle of the discussion is that whatever economy we have is pretty much built on men's backs. And yes, men and women both work now um, in, in wage-earning uh, fields as opposed to in, in cooperative um, family systems. But when it really boils down to it, when you look at who is um, the creative force in the world, who is the one who built who is, uh, up the society that we have now, as opposed to, as you know, with respect to invention, with respect to um, actually putting forth the labor, with respect to defending that which was built, with that's been mainly men. Um, I guess that's just the, that's basically the point that I wanted to make related to that. At whether whether you're for one system or another, um, that thing to not forget. Yep, it definitely is the thing to not forget. And really, it is men um, who believe that their worth is, pay, is their paycheck. And when you have a group of people who believe their worth is their paycheck, you can extort all kinds of concessions from them. And not just that, you can use them to build empires because they'll sacrifice for that. They'll sacrifice for you because they want a positive identity. And if you challenge that, you challenge the stratification. You take away the tools that create this kind of stratification. So that's my opinion. And I'm not talking about it in the context of socialism or top-down solutions. I'm talking about bottom-up solutions, starting with informing them that they can make other choices besides locking themselves into these to be wage slave them. And I just wanted to mention, because uh, I did say that um, I did say that gender disparities in federal criminal cases that uh, that uh, it, they, it does actually favor women. Um, the paper is estimating gender disparities in federal, in federal criminal cases by Sonia B. Starr from the University of Michigan Law School. And she found that the uh, uh, large gender graphs favoring women throughout the sentence length distribution, averaging over 60%. So yes, if we're going to talk about gender sen gender-based sentencing, feminists do not base what they're saying on reality. They base it on their theories. And I'm going to uh, ask Sage. Sage, did you have anything to add for the end of the show? Well, um, I feel like uh, the only thing I could add is just a kind of a rehashing of everything we've covered in a few short sentences. We're talking, to, uh, we've covered briefly the uh, people who dissent actually coming out and uh, discussing things in a more civil format as opposed to pulling a fire alarm or frankly being violent. And uh, we also um, kind of saw a brief foray at the end toward uh, using an ideal to solve everything instead of context-centric pragmatism. And I think that um, the only thing I could really say to that is that I'm just happy that there's more, there are more chances for people to actually wake up and actually look at the circumstances they're at and get around to talking about them instead of being stuck uh, comparing them to some nebulous ideal that no one seems to understand anyway. That's all. Okay, thank you, Sage. Well, it's that time again, time to end the show and to give thanks. Thanks to our listeners and our callers. Thanks to our donors as well. And if you do want to throw a few shekels in our hat, please go to our website at www.honeybadgerbrigade.com and click on the donate button. We definitely are in need of funds to fund our advertising and expansion endeavors. And we just, you know, it just really helps out. And for those of you who are first-time listeners, you can access the YouTube archive of our shows through our YouTube channel. It's www.youtube.com slash user slash Honey Badger Radio. And don't forget to check out our store at www.cafepress.com slash Honey Badger Brigade. Thank you to my co-hosts for always keeping it real. Thank you to Phil for animating our ad every week, to Europa for his amazing art, and to James for keeping everything running smoothly. Thank you in particular to Hannah and Sage and Ginko for calling in. And thanks to our listeners and callers once again. 
And uh, be sure to tune in next week. Same Badger time, same Badger station. This is Honey. This is Honey Badger Radio, reminding you to take the red.